Thanks. Uh, well, it's, it's, it's nice to be here. Um, never need too much of an arm twisting to have an excuse to come up to Utah State. Um, so thanks to Dave and others who extended an invitation. I, I'm uh, excited to be here. Uh, let me just briefly tell you something about myself and then, um, then I'll get into some of the things that I had prepared. Uh, as was mentioned, I'm uh, the president of a company in Salt Lake that uh, it's called Mountain West Small Business Finance. We provide um, financing for small businesses uh, in cooperation with local banks and the Small Business Administration. And we finance primarily uh, real estate and equipment for businesses. So we don't do start, you know, we don't finance startup businesses, which I, I'm assuming that many of you are interested in. And I was told that this is a, a class on entrepreneurism. Hopefully that's the case, because that's what I prepared for. Um, but we, we deal with a lot of entrepreneurs, but uh, maybe at a little bit later stage in the uh, growth and development of their business. And we provide biz, uh, financing for their offices or their uh, production facilities or things or, um, you know, w whatever it might be and for some of their equipment. And we work in cooperation with banks, uh, banks and credit unions and other sources. So I've had an opportunity to do that for going on 30 years and so I've seen a lot of entrepreneurs and I've observed um, a lot of characteristics and things that make entrepreneurs successful and, and also things that, uh, that contribute to their difficulties. So um, I thought that might be one thing that I could pass on uh, to you today. Um, I was uh, born and raised in Salt Lake. Uh, and uh, educated both here at Utah State and at the University of Utah. In fact, uh, Dave never believed that I really went to Utah State, so here's my, here's my student card, 1970-71. Now, I would pass this around, but in those days, your student number was your social security number, so it's <laughs> emblazoned on the card. And my birth date is on there, too. So I'm sure that uh, for identity theft reasons, I wouldn't, you know, probably shouldn't pass it around. But, but there I am. And uh, um, I I'd actually dug out my transcript for my first quarter, not semester. Um, American national government, I got a B, five hours. Uh, freshman English, a B, three hours. Uh, intro to Sociology, five hours, taught by a guy named Albrecht. Um, in fact, we've compared notes, and uh, I was in his first class. This was his first uh, class on campus, uh, Intro to Sociology, 19, fall of 1970. And basketball. Uh, one hour, E, not because I wasn't a good basketball player, but like Nate, <laughs> but I was lazy. It was a 7.30 a.m. class somewhere, I can't remember, it wasn't HPR, because I don't think that existed in 1970, but it was Monday morning at 7.30 and there was no way that I was going to get out of bed and I didn't have a clue that you could drop your classes so that E haunted me for the rest of my college career trying to get my GPA up. It's funny how that one hour 
had an in impact, but I, suffer, I made it. I, I got through it. Graduated from the University of Utah with a degree in political science and a minor in geography and a secondary teaching certificate. Taught school for a few years. Taught at Brighton High when Dave was there. I don't think Dave had me for a teacher, but I, but I taught there when he was there. So that tells you how old both of us are. And, uh, and then after that, kind of unknowingly became an entrepreneur, kind of a, a reluctant entrepreneur myself. I, I look at a lot of the characteristics that entrepreneurs have, and I don't necessarily see those characteristics in myself. Some of them I do, but, but some of them, I'm a lot, I tend to be a little more risk averse than, than many of them are. So, uh, and that's when I just through a fortunate uh, chain of events was able to um, be in the right place at the right time and, and start Mountain West Small Business Finance. Um, and uh, I guess that story will be for another day. It's not that interesting. So, <laughs> Uh, how many of you, besides Catherine, are in the are in the class I spoke to a couple of weeks ago? Yeah, going to South America? Any of you? Any of you guys going to South America with us? Okay. Well, at least other than Dave, at least this won't be a repeat for you. I wanted to start by giving you some investment advice. I have a hot tip for you. Um, uh, this is one you can jump on right now. What is the most important thing that you can invest in right now? Life insurance, annuities. No, yourself, yourself. You, you got it. Um, my observation as I've been back up here for the last almost 10 years involved with Utah State and with students in the business school, uh, the most important investment that you can make right now is an investment in yourself and that more particularly an investment in your education. Um, more important than life insurance, more important than Apple stock, more important than, than just about anything else. Um, you've already made an excellent investment decision. Um, you are at the finest university in the state of Utah um, with a tradition that you need to take advantage of. And that is the tradition of, of instructors, professors, and mentors like Dave and like Paul Felstead and like uh, Chris Fawson and and many others who, um, who are willing to spend time one-on-one -on -one with, with students and make your investment in your education and in, your, in yourself uh, something that has a great deal of value. And one of the things that I've observed um, as I've been back here and, and if this was not something that I learned on my own when I was here, I, I didn't take advantage of when I was here, and didn't really take advantage of at the University of Utah either. But the opportunities are unparalleled here for you to interact with professors and to take, you know, the, the benefit of taking advantage of those opportunities. Um, you don't have those opportunities at the U or at BYU or, or even, even at the smaller, you know, like maybe at SUU a little bit, but maybe at Dixie, I don't know, but I've, I've observed all of them. I've, I've observed students at all of them. Uh, there's no, there's nothing like Utah State. So you've already made that decision. I urge you to take full advantage of the opportunities that are there. Now, you know, you talk to Dave, he's teaching seven classes this semester. It's not like 
Isn't that right? Six or seven? It's not like he's got a lot of time to just, you know, loaf around. Um, so you have to take the initiative. You need to reach out. Um, get out of your comfort zone. Um, you know, reach out. They will be receptive and they'll be there to help you. The other thing that I would encourage you to do is diversify your portfolio. Okay, what do I mean by that? Um, you're all, I would imagine most of you are business majors. Uh, take advantage of other opportunities on campus. I mean, it wouldn't hurt you to take a political science class, would it, Dave? <laughs> Dave's an old political poli sci major. It wouldn't hurt you to even, you know, find out what's going on at the uh, Kane School of Arts. Um, it wouldn't hurt you to, to go to a few concerts. It wouldn't hurt you to, to um, you know, learn about animal husbandry, whatever. You know, there's great opportunities up here. Take advantage of it. Broaden your, your, um, your horizons. Uh, it'll help you immensely when you launch your business, when you get into the business world. Uh, it'll give you confidence. It'll give you uh, a breadth of knowledge that will be very valuable to you. So, you know, the, the mistake I made was political science and geography were easy. They came easy to me. Um, you know, I didn't have to work a lot to, to figure it out. And so, you know, my attitude was I'm going to take easy classes. I'm going to get through. I'm going to get done. And I'll see what happens once I finish. Stupid thing to do. Um, you know, I didn't get out of my comfort zone. I didn't branch out. I didn't take advantage of opportunities, even at as few as there might have been at the U. Um, there are great opportunities for you here. Take advantage of it. Um, and it'll pay big dividends for you in the future. Okay? All right, enough soapbox. Um, anybody in here speak French? Do you? Okay. Tell me how to pronounce this. I know how to kind of how I would say that in Spanish. How would you say it in French? Ferdinand? Close enough? Oh, we wouldn't say the N, N and D. Ferdinand? No vowel at the end, so we wouldn't say the N and D at the end. Okay, so just, oh, okay. So they just kind of get lazy and don't say that, huh? <laughs> All right. How do you pronounce this? Okay. Well, my Spanish is going to be close enough then. Ferdinand de Lessa. Okay. <laughs> well, I just didn't know, you know, you read a book and you, and you have this pronunciation in your head and you never know if it's really how you say it. Close enough. Okay. Uh, who's got your Google going? Google him. Tell us who he is. You're surfing the web there. Shouldn't take you too long. French developer of the Suez Canal. Yeah. Suez Canal. Okay. You think that has anything to do with entrepreneurism? Apparently it does, otherwise I wouldn't be talking about it, right? Okay. This is the guy that was the, the sort of the driving force behind the construction of the Suez Canal. Now, I know you've got plenty to read, but in your off time, you know, I would highly recommend this book, The Path Between the Seas by David McCullough. 
This was one of his earlier works. He's the guy that wrote uh, John Adams. He just wrote a book about Truman. This is, this is a book about the uh, creation of the Panama Canal. Um, but it goes back and starts with a discussion about Ferdinand de Lesseps um, and his role in building the Suez Canal. I hope that you know enough about geography to know where the Suez Canal is. Anybody not know where it is? Egypt? Okay. Um, De Lesseps was born in, in France, obviously. His father was a diplomat, a French diplomat. He was educated in Paris and followed in his father's um, footsteps into first the military service and then into the uh, diplomatic service. He was born in 1805. Um, 1828, so at age 23, he took his first diplomatic job. He was the vice consul to Tunisia. Do we know where that is? That's in the news these days. Northern Africa, borders on the Mediterranean. Um, and for the next several years, he took different diplomatic posts in different countries uh, around the Mediterranean. Um, in 1832, he was the vice, he was appointed to be the vice consul to Alexandria, Egypt. He sailed there on some French sailing vessel, and apparently the, the uh, practice of the day when a vessel from a foreign land sailed into port was to quarantine the vessel for a period of time, I think about 25 days. So he pulls into port, but they have to stay on the ship, and so he's got time on his hands, and so he starts reading up on his new appointment. And one of the things he reads is a memoir that was written by a French civil engineer um, at the direction of Napoleon uh, regarding the construction or the concept of a canal that would connect the, um, you know, the, the Mediterranean with the uh, southern uh, Indian and Persian Gulf and all of that, the, the southern Indian Ocean. So he was captivated by this idea for some reason, uh, just kind of caught his fancy, and he talked to Egyptian leaders about it, but uh, it didn't have any legs at that time. It didn't catch on right away. Um, and so, you know, they talked about it, but it didn't go anywhere. And then later... Um, he was uh, appointed to go different places, uh, Rotterdam, Barcelona, Madrid, Rome, so he was well-traveled. Um, uh, ultimately uh, ended up as the consul general to, in Cairo to the Egyptian government, and then ended up in the Vatican. And... Uh, I won't bore you with all the details, but he basically, when he was the ambassador, had some diplomatic role at the Vatican, he uh, was perceived to uh, have overstepped his bounds, uh, overstepped his authority, and he was fired. He was uh, kind of fired in some degree of disgrace. Uh, and so... That was the end of his diplomatic career. Uh, McCullough says uh, at the age of 43, so this was 20 or so years of a diplomatic career, at the age of 43 he was out, he was without the career, his background and natural gifts had so ideally suited him for, and to which he had given himself so wholeheartedly. 
The future was a blank page. He was in debt. Public disgrace was something he had never experienced. Yet outwardly, he remained the man he had always been, a jaunty, confident, up dawn, busy every day. Um, a few years later, he was reconnected with a young man that he had met in his days in Cairo, uh, Mohammed Saeed. Mohammed Saeed was a young child at the time he was the general consul in Cairo, uh, child to the, one of the leaders in Egypt. And so he had become acquainted. Apparently the child kind of took a fancy to him. And uh, when Mohammed Saeed ascended to become the viceroy of Egypt, um, he remembered Delesip. And he had the idea, he, he expressed an idea that he wanted to commence his regime as the leader of Egypt with some great enterprise. And so he tracked down Delesip, he called on him to come to Egypt, and I don't know if he had the Suez Canal in mind, but, but he might have. But he brought Delesip in and said, hey, I want to do something grand. I want to do something big. What ideas have you got? And um, initially, Delesip didn't bring up the Suez Canal. He basically just said, um, well, let me think about it, I guess. So, and I apologize for reading some of this, but McAuliffe explains it in uh, in in a great way. So I want to share a, a few things about, about what happened next. Um, Delesip is in Egypt and he, he uh, decides to go out into the desert. And, and uh, so he goes out and he's out in the desert they're camping, you know, probably pretty luxurious, but they're out in the desert. Um, and this is what uh, McCullough says. At night, he searched the desert sky. Before dawn, he was up and out of doors. The day was uh, spent galloping over the desert on a magnificent Arabian steed. You can kind of picture that. But the following morning, he knew the moment had come. He was standing at the opening to his tent, wrapped in a red dressing gown, looking and feeling for all the world like an Arabian sheik. The description that follows is from his journal. The sun's rays were already lightening up the eastern horizon. In the west, it was still dark and cloudy. Suddenly, I saw a vivid colored rainbow stretching across the sky from east to west. I must admit that I felt my heart beat violently, for this token of a covenant seemed to presage that the moment had come for the consummation of the union between East and West, meaning the, the Suez Canal. And thus, the Great Canal was launched. And so he goes to Mohammed Saeed and um, pitches the idea of the Suez Canal. Um, he broached the subject to Saeed at the close of the day. Um, Saeed asked very few questions, then declared the matter settled. His staff was summoned to hear the news. Uh, nothing had, said about, had been said about cost. Uh, the Delesips had no experience faintly related to such an undertaking, that he represented no powerful organization, no combination of interests, that he had neither rank nor office nor any entree to financial sources seemed not to have concerned either of them. Now listen to some of the things he says next and see how this applies to entrepreneurism. For the next 15 years, he was everywhere at once. Egypt, London, Constantinople, Paris, coaxing, flattering, convincing monarchs and newspaper editors. 
issuing endless reports, driving the work forward in the desert, watching out every detail, frequently overruling his technical advisors, defying the European bankers, facing the scorn of the English Prime Minister, who called him a swindler and a fool, and who saw the canal as nothing more than a cheap French grab for power in the Mediterranean. Approximately half the money came from France, from 25,000 small investors, mostly uh, arranged for by de Lesseps. The rest of, uh, of the money came from Mohammed Saeed, when Saeed died in 1863, his replacement, um, somebody Ishmael, was even more beneficent, so much so that by 1869 he had ne nearly put Egypt into bankruptcy. In the final stages it had been the colossal steam dredges designed by French engineers that made the difference. Um, nor can the repeated influence of the Empress, her faith in her brilliant cousin, so this is the French Empress, and de Lesip was her cousin, nor could that be discounted. Yet de Lesip remained the driving spirit, and in truth he was something under, new under the sun. He had no historical counterpart. What he was, what he became, was the entrepreneur extraordinaire with all the requisite traits for the role. Nerve, persistence, dynamic energy, a talent for propaganda, a capacity for deception, imagination. He was a bit of an actor and as shrewd and silky a diplomat as any one of his time. And then this is what uh, Jules Verne said. Um, his, he persevered, you see, a grandson was re, would recall. He was a very stubborn man. Jules Verne recalled it the genius of will. But de Lesip spoke of patience. I wait with patience, he wrote to a correspondent in the final year of the work. Patience, which I assure you, requires more force of character then does action. In November of 1869, then, the Suez Canal was completed and opened. And de Lesip was a hero. He was, uh, you know, lauded all over the world for what he had done. And, you know, so that story is that part of the book. And then you... And then you carry on for the rest of the book about the building of the Panama Canal. And um, uh, here's what, uh, um, let's see, here's what, here's what else um, McCullough says about De Lesip. Views in retro, viewed in retrospect, De Lesip's life stands out as one of the most extraordinary of the 19th century even without the Panama venture, that he of all men of his time should have been the one to make the miracle happen at Suez is in itself miraculous. Suddenly, there he was, known after 1869 as the great engineer. He was no such thing. He had no technical background, no experience in finance, his skills and administrator were modest. Routine of any kind bored him quickly. So what followed? He was called upon when the decision was made to explore the, uh, the building of the Panama Canal. And there were two issues that had to be resolved before that could be started. The first was what would the best route be? Would it be through Nicaragua? Would it be through Panama? What part of Panama? The second was what type of canal to build? What was built in Suez? 
basically Suez is a canal without locks. It's sea level to sea level. Basically all they had to do was dig a trench from one end to the other. Um, there was no change in elevation. That's not the case in Panama, but what was the big <laughs> folly that de Lesseps made? De Lesseps made the decision the Panama Canal will be a sea level canal. We'll do the same thing we did in Suez. We'll build, we'll just dig a trench and the French can do it. And the other decision that was made was we won't have any locks. We won't, you know, we won't build the locks. We'll, we'll build it in Panama. We won't, it will be a, a sea level uh, canal. And then the mess starts to happen. And as, as you probably know, after many, many years and the failure of the French, thousands and thousands of deaths, um, just a total catastrophe, uh, the United States under Teddy Roosevelt comes in, I think it was Teddy Roosevelt, yeah, comes in and builds a lock canal. Have any of you been to Pan Panama? Any of you seen how that works? It's, it's an engineering marvel. Um, and so the great entrepreneur found his, his uh, downfall with the um, Panama Canal. Okay, what lessons do we learn from that? Um, or what are, and what are some of the characteristics of an entrepreneur? Let me, uh, while you're thinking about that, I have a little case study here for you. This is the, oh, this is the same one we did. So Catherine will be familiar with this. Take one of these and pass it around. Um, what are some of the characteristics of, uh, of an entrepreneur? Le I just happened to be preparing this when uh, a new issue of Utah Business Magazine came out. And I was interested because it was a, the focus, uh, the cover story was successful CEOs of businesses here in Utah. And some of them shared some of their uh, advice on success and what, what it means to be a successful CEO, a successful leader of a business. Uh, Fred Lampropoulos, uh, the, the CEO of Merit Medical Systems, said the key to success is being decisive and grasping opportunities before they disappear. Uh, Rich Parkinson, the, the CEO of Associated Food Stores, find out where your heart is. Find out your passion. What's most important to you as an individual? That passion will drive you to excellence because we typically do best what we enjoy most. Um, Michael Phillips, Phillips Edison Company, a real estate developer. Patience and adaptability. Whatever you think is going to happen, it's always going to be different. Your ability to be nimble and adapt and learn what you need to learn is the secret to being successful. Okay? So, take a look at this little case study that I handed out to you. This is, <clears throat> this is a, an adaptation of a real deal that was brought to our company. I've changed names, dates, locations uh, to, to protect the uh, innocent. But this is uh, Hiram Arts Center. This is a Utah State University professor of secondary education who, along with his wife and his daughter, want to buy an old, vacant, historic LDS meeting house in Hiram. 
and turn it into what? An art center, and what else? Daycare, reception center. <laughs> Good, Dave. <laughs> see, did you see Dave's response? That was kind of mine, too. <laughs> okay, $1.2 million. 625000 to buy it. 555000 to renovate it. And 75000 in miscellaneous closing costs. They want to borrow 45% of that from the USU Credit Union and they wanted me to loan them uh, 40%, 502000 and they would put 15% down. Um, Cliff, as I say, is a professor of secondary education, 35 years of teaching experience, um, in Utah and California. He's been the CEO of several other businesses including uh, land real estate development and land surveying. His wife Judith has worked with Cliff over the years in a number of these businesses. She's also been a host for dignitaries for the LDS Church in California and she's <clears throat> been involved in her community as a playwright a poet, and an artist. Their daughter, Juline, is an interior designer, composer, playwright, voice, and piano teacher. She's been the director of annual pageants and smaller productions. What are those smaller productions, Catherine? Road shows. <laughs> Hiram Art Center will offer a wide variety of activities that are community and art oriented. It'll be an outlet for those seeking to develop their talents. We'll offer art classes, uh, acting, dancing, sculpting, scrapbooking, private piano and instrument lessons, private voice. It'll also offer a preschool for ages three to five and also serve as a reception center. Cliff and Judith have liquid assets. What are liquid assets? Cash or marketable stocks, right? 25,000, real estate of 1.2 million, total assets of 3.25 million, total liabilities of 822,000, a net worth of 2.4 million. Do you know what FICO scores are? What are they? Your credit. Yeah. And what's a good FICO score? Uh, mid 700s. Yeah, that's really good. If you're in the mid 700s, you can just about, you know, borrow wherever. So Cliff has a 610. What's a bad FICO score? <laughs> <laughs> Almost. <laughs> Below 600 is not is if you're in the 500s, you're not going to get anywhere. Uh, his wife is a 720 and his daughter is a 735. Cliff's score is low because he co-signed with his son on a home in St. George. The account is three payments past due. The house is under contract for a short sale. Okay, do you know what a short sale is? Louder. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, quick, yes, and also what? Or less. Yeah, short sales are usually quick sales for less than what is owed. But they're rarely ever quick. That's right. <laughs> yeah, you're right. They Once you settle on one, it takes a long time to make them come to fruition. Um, Cliff is also a successful uh, owner of a printing firm called Hexagon Press. Uh, the net worth of the company is negative 121560 and profits after tax are for, uh, in 2010 are negative 22522 
pr pretty successful printing business, right? <laughs> and then you've got some projections there. So, uh, first of all, do you see characteristics in common between De Lesseps and this guy? And if so, what are they? And second of all, what questions do you, would you ask if you were being asked, like I was, to loan him $500,000? Okay, what characteristics do you see <clears throat> that those two entrepreneurs have in common? Uh, he has, <laughs> well, like the list of, he was not an engineer, he didn't know finance, he, he was just kind of a madman going for a dream. And I feel like that's exactly what he's doing here. Except his dream isn't, I don't know, profitable. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So he's a dream. They're dreamers. Yes. Um, both people seem to have a dream that involves a place in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> Hiram? <laughs> okay. So you're questioning location, location, location? Is that what I hear you saying? Dave, what were you going to say? Well, they both have uh, some substantial defeats in the past. Ah. But how did they deal with <clears throat> personal, uh, what, what should we say, personal chal um, challenges or that makes it sound like yeah, setbacks. I like that. That's good. That's more positive. Personal setbacks. Do you think when you launch your entrepreneurial dream that you won't have personal setbacks? If <clears throat> if you do, you're you're a dreamer. <laughs> Which is a characteristic of many entrepreneurs, yeah. Not and, and then this is not a negative or positive thing, you know. I mean, it's the dreaming that, that drives many of these entrepreneurs. What other, remember some of the characteristics that, that uh, were mentioned? Um, what did his grandson, or what did Jules Verne talk about? Stubborn. St yeah, stubborn. How do you spell stubborn? O R N. Um, patient, right? He he himself said that patience was the more difficult thing for him than taking action. Uh, but I, as I read about him, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have listed patience as one of his characteristics. But he himself felt that he was patient. What else? Uh, how about uh, a capacity for deception, an imagination, a bit of an actor, a shrewd and silky diplomat? You know, there's, there's positives and negatives to all of those. Um, but boy, entrepreneurs, they are good at that stuff for some reason, right Dave? I mean they just... <laughs> Not you. <laughs> yes, they are good at that. Yeah. Um, what other questions would you have asked? We only got another minute, but would you have made this guy the loan? Yeah, or uh, what I would, what I called it was, they want me to loan them money so they can do their hobby, yeah. <laughs> right? Is that kind of the impression you get? Yeah, 
I see no, I see no revenue model. I see no uh, competitive advantage to other things in Hiram. What's the demand like? Uh huh. Now you'd want to, you'd want to dig into that, wouldn't uh, you? I want to see a little bit of a proven market. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ah, yeah. Any concerns about his FICO score? Or his willingness to short sell? Which means if you sell it for less than is owed, who's going to take it in the shorts? The bank. Whoever loaned him the money. And if you're a lender, um, you know what the five... C's of credit are, I can't remember all five, but one of them's character, collateral, cash flow, character. You'd, you'd, you might question the, his character there a little bit. Well, time to finish. Um, you guys are great. Uh, I love Utah State, and you guys are this is a great time in your life, so take advantage of it, and good, good luck to you in your entrepreneurial dream. I'm sure you'll do well. No, I didn't. <laughs> Much to the chagrin of my loan officer, we didn't. Thanks, guys.